The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Can we turn that? Yeah. All right, we're good. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Um, today we're here to talk about don't be a target, uh, protecting yourself when you're outside your network. My name is Tim Fowler. I'm a network engineer at Sabai Technology. Big disclaimer at the very beginning of this presentation. I'm going to be demonstrating some wireless, um, essentially wireless hacking methodologies and attacks that you're vulnerable to in the outside. You do not have to participate in, this, in these demonstrations. I'll, I'll let you know when it's, they're about to happen. If you don't want to participate, you can just simply disable your wireless for just a couple of minutes. But I do encourage you to actually participate because it's really, really fun. It's really, really cool. What you're going to see is a little bit creepy um, because most of you guys are going to be connecting back to me automatically. Um, and I'm going to show you how that works. And at the end of the result of this presentation is how do you protect yourself against people like me? No, this, I'll go ahead and tell you, I've got, I've got a little portable router right here, but it's not internet connected at all. Um, I'm going to walk through every step of what I'm doing. Um, I can go ahead and tell you, uh, there's nothing completely, nothing harm. Um, if you actually, you should be seeing an access point uh, right now, it's called don't be a target. Does anybody see that? If you pull up your wireless networks, you'll see that. That's actually me. but. Don't worry, there's a, no internet connection, nothing's harmful. I'm gonna be completely transparent with what's going on. This is an educational course. This is not, um, I'm not gonna actually teach you the methodologies of how I'm doing this. I'm gonna explain what's going on and how to prevent that, but this is not actually Hacking 101. So that being said, I will give you um, uh, enough fair warning when this is about to happen, but I do encourage you, um, there is an entertainment value to what's gonna be taking place. The first thing we're going to talk about with, uh, in this talk is convenience. Specifically convenience in networking. There's always a cost in convenience. We're always going to sacrifice something or it's going to physically cost us something. I've got three examples of convenience here. We've got a convenience store uh, that's actually supposed to be movie tickets that you purchase online. Um, and we also have toilet paper, which is we're going to get to in just a moment. Uh, the first thing, convenience store. We all have them. We'll run, go get a drink, a bag of chips, or something like that. But what we'll typically do is we end up paying more for those products because we're not going to like a big box store or something. We're paying for the convenience factor. Um, and this is something that you need to keep in mind when it comes to your security is what is, what is this convenience factor going to cost me? Same thing with like uh, Ticketmaster, Fandango. Anybody use those services? Well, if you do, at the very right before you go and actually check out, you'll see this lovely thing called convenience charge or convenience fee. You're paying more money for the convenience. Uh, toilet paper. It's really, really interesting. Um, does anybody here, let's be we're really open here, does anybody buy the absolute cheapest toilet paper that they can? Okay, so we got one, okay? I was about to say, you're probably a college student, okay? Typically, we make an investment in toilet paper, buy the buy better stuff, because it serves us much better. I maintain there's two things in life you don't skimp on, toilet paper and Oreos. If you've ever had a knockoff Oreo, it's disgusting. Always get the name brand. So, so we've, al we've already got these methodologies in our systems where we're used to, to sacrificing something, either financial, but we also have this example here where we're actually going, we're giving our money for a better service, for uh, a better, dare I say, user experience with toilet paper. So this is something I want you to keep in mind. We're already doing this in our daily lives, but we're not doing it when we're dealing with networks. And that's got to change. What is the cost of convenience in networking? There's one really simple answer to this. Security. Security and convenience. If I, make a, if I have a network system that is convenient to the end user, I'm typically 
Uh, it's at the cost of security. Uh, the perfect example is this. Anybody familiar with WPS? Wi-Fi protected setup. Horrible, 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 horrible thing. It's awful. It was like, hey, I can go push a button and now my clients can automatically connect. There was two fundamental flaws in this process and it was the way the standard was written. The first, you have an eight digit PIN number that's only numeric. So I could brute force that because you've got eight to the 10th power, you know? So yeah, I think that's uh, 10 billion. I'm not good with my exponents, but 10 billion, 100 billion, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot, but I could still brute force this over enough time. Well, they implemented it so that they break the PIN in half. You calculate the first four digits. You complete a handshake. Then you uh, calculate the next three digits, and the last one's a sum, check sum. So now I have four to the, uh, 10 to the fourth plus 10 to the third, 11,000 possibilities. I can brute force you in under 20 hours. And they thought this was a good idea. Well, <laughs> WPS came about because of an invention of, from Microsoft called Windows 7. They wanted it to make it user friendly. One of the other specifications of WPS is the fact that any router access point has an, what's called an internal registrar. And that's what actually contains all your information, your SSID, um, your encryption level, your password, things like that. WPS, by the standard, has to respond to an external registrar. What that, if, has anybody ever plugged up a brand new out of the box router to a Windows 7 machine? And it's like, hey, would you like to set up your network? Has anybody seen that? Okay, that's the external registrar. Windows 7 acts as an external registrar. I can actually pass your network information to the router from the host. You can, yeah, you can completely bypass that, but it has, the, the, the default standard requires it to respond to that. So now I brute force your PIN number, your router hands me all your information, and I'm going, no, here's your SSID, here's your password, here's your security level. And it's like, all right, that's cool, I'm cool with that. So we have this really convenient feature that's ridiculously insecure. And so what was the expense? It's security, typically open networks, and we're about to discuss those. Open networks come with a huge convenience cost of security. Uh, one thing we're going to talk about is what is valuable to you. Uh, sensitive data, your email address, Facebook account, banking info, your children's information. This, this messes with a lot of parents. Any parents here? How would you feel knowing that something you did at Starbucks made your child's information vulnerable? Not a good feeling as a parent, knowing that you're putting your child's future at risk. So these are things that we have to ask ourselves every single day. What is my data worth to, to me? Because to me, your information doesn't have a value, but to you it does. And we have to, the only person that's gonna care about your data is gonna be you. We have to take an offensive approach to protecting our information, specifically when we're outside of our network. We're gonna talk about a couple weaknesses in 802.11 because this is specifically the, the vector that I'm gonna be talking about. The first one is remember networks. By default, almost every single internet connected device uh, available on the market remembers networks that you connect to by default. You can easily disable this feature. Go ahead and do it. You can do it right now if you would like. Remember networks actually puts you at a very vulnerable state because, and you'll see in, in, in an instance, um, your computer is always looking for that network. And it's always looking for that network through probe requests and responses. Every remember network that you have in your device list is sending out uh, a probe request. And it's simply saying, hey, Jim, is your Wi-Fi around? And if it doesn't get a response, it's like, okay. And in just a little bit later, it's like, hey, Jim, is your Wi-Fi around? And that's what enables us to go from our home network quickly to our office network without actually having to log, you know, switch networks, log in, or enter password stuff. It's doing it for us. Why? Because it's convenient. There again, what are we, what's the cost of this convenience? And a little bit, I'm just, I'm gonna show you that the cost is your security. 
Um, also, auto association to the AP. This is a part of the, the response. Hey, Jim, your Wi-Fi around? Yes, I'm around. Cool. I'm going to connect. All right, cool. It happens automatically. You didn't do anything. There was no user interaction to connect to the Wi-Fi. Um, it's very convenient, but here again, this is, a, this is an issue within 802.11 that actually puts you at risk um, down the line that we're about to see. Trust relationships. At some point in time, you're going to have to trust somebody with your internet connection. How many people here trust their ISP? Okay, let me take one step back. How many people trust their home network? Okay. To, to a degree, and part of the reason you probably don't trust your home network is because of the ISP. Uh, let's be honest, okay? How many people trust Starbucks wireless? All right. How many people trust me? Good answer. You should not trust me. Already at this point, you shouldn't trust me. I'm going to give you even more uh, ammunition for that fire. So. At some point in time, you're going to have to trust somebody with your internet connection. It doesn't, it, whether you're running through a VPN or you're at your works office, your home office, you're going to trust somebody to be able to see what you're doing on the internet and have access to your data. The question is, who are you going to trust? Where are you going to put your trust? I'm definitely not going to trust a uh, self-public network. I know the guys that set up the network, they're really cool. I'm not going to trust them with my internet connection, with the data that I'm sending across. I trust my home network um, because I, for the most part, have control over it with the exception of the ISP. So if I have the opportunity to get back to my home network to a more trusted location, I need to do that. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. Open networks, real simple, don't do it. Real simple, don't connect to open networks. And I'll show you why here in just a few moments. Uh, everybody knows what karma is. We, we all know the phrase, karma's a bitch. Well, it really, really is. Um, and if you do not want to participate here in the next few moments, go ahead and disable your wireless now. Um, because I'm getting ready to activate karma. Karma, is anybody familiar with host APD? Okay, it's a... Uh, um, it's a piece of software that allows you to run an access point on a Linux box. Really, really powerful, really, really cool. Well, Karma is a patch version of host APD. Uh, it was produced by a guy who goes by Digital Ninja. I can't remember his name right offhand. But it's really, really, huh? Jeff. Yes, yes. Um, really, really cool, really, really powerful. Um, but is it exactly what it is? Um, so. As, as you guys are disabling your wireless, I'm actually going to enable Karma just for a second, and I'm going to explain what Karma's about to do to you guys. Probe request. Everybody's sending out many, many probe requests right now, looking for networks that, they, that they're used to connecting to. Karma simply says, this is how that works. The probe request goes out, hey, Jim, is your wireless network here? Karma goes, Yep. And if, that's, if you're sending out a probe request for an open network, you will connect to me automatically. I am now your ISP. I'm the man in the middle. I control your internet. I control everything you do on the internet. I can, from here, from this device, now I have open reign on what I can do, the manipulation of track. Yes, question. What is if OpenBSD and your packets are encrypted and it's heavy encryption? Okay, we're going to talk about that uh, in, in, in at the end of the presentation as far as how to protect yourself. Um, so let me show, um, get this up, give me one second. And I'll pull this over to the screen. All right, Karma is officially enabled on this device. Um, so if you guys start, we'll start checking your wireless um, devices. What you'll start to see is in just a few moments, you'll start to see networks that you clearly know are not here, um, specifically like your home network, um, things of that nature. And it's already working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this over here and put this up. And what you're going to see is this list on here. And this is a list of access points that devices are actually actively trying to connect to. Um, so 
We've got guest, uh, UNCC 49er. Who's that? Okay. Um, Niner Wi-Fi Secure, that's probably you again. Um, man, you're, you're, probably gonna get the, you're probably gonna get the most because you're, you guys are closest to the antenna. Um, get, oh, well, somebody's actually connected to me. Who's on guest? Anybody, anybody has ever connected to a guest? Okay, you're mine. I own you now. You're coming through me. Now, you actually don't have internet access, so don't worry, you're safe. Um, <laughs> But in a, in a real world instance, I would um, bridge my internet access that I have on my laptop to this router. So now I'm serving internet directly from the access point you, you were actually thinking you were connected. Well, were you previously connected to a network before this? Was, you were on self. Yeah, we were well, what happened? Why did you connect to me? You were on a network because you're in closer proximity. I'm in closer proximity to you than the self access point is to your system. So it's always sending out probe requests even if you're connected to a network. So you just network hopped and did nothing. Your system did that on its own question. Is it distance or signal strength? Well, it's a, it's a, com it's a combination. It is, it's technically si signal strength, um, but I, I currently have a 9 dBi antenna on there, so I can actually you know, reach out. Uh, the Wi-Fi adapter that's at, or chipset that's in this is a little low power. Um, it's designed to be a close proximity honeypot, um, but I've actually uh, converted this over to run on, on a full-blown laptop with a lot more power, and you can do some really cool things. Um, but it, it's all about the response time of that network. If, if I respond to your probe faster than self does, it's going to revert. Also, it deals with network priority. If you connect to guest more and you have it higher in your list, it's going to force that connection over. Question? I was wondering, I mean, if I'm still connected to the uh, vendor network. Yeah. Per so yeah, per perfect. Ex and, and this is something we're going to get into the vendor network, okay? The vendor network is encrypted, it has a pass key. The one limitation to, to Karma is that it doesn't have the authentication keys. I was saying more like, because I do have public networks in there that because you're stronger, it should be forcing me over. But well, yeah, and, and sometimes, and it's all, it's, it's channel hopping. It's, it's, doing, it's doing a lot of things, and it doesn't work all the time um, for every single network and things like that. Um, but, and it's mostly geared towards looking at multiple probe requests, seeing, you know, especially if there's multiple devices. Yes, Jim? Because it's, it is a higher priority uh, to maintain that level of security. I mean, because you do have a natural, natural hierarchy in that security uh, model. So let's, let's scroll down and see if we've got any more fun victims. I mean, uh, volunteers. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. Look at all those associations. Look at, let's see. Um, and I, I, I typically, we, we actually have a lot of people that are connected directly to me. Don't be a target. I encourage you to move up if you can't see. Um, Asus underscore Clark. Yep. All right, cool, you're present. Um, Boardwalk, Orchard Garden, um, ATT uh, 616, ATT 032, um, Southern, Dermgast, Fig, um, Duke Blue, who are you? Please leave. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but as you can see, and if you actually pull up your devices, you will see these networks being broadcast available to you. But your computers are, are doing this automatically, and this is a huge vulnerability that you have. Question? Um, if, if our network shows, why does my home network show up? Why is your home network showing up? Show up? Okay, perfect. But it's encrypted, right? You have a password. Okay. What is, it's still, you're still sending out a probe request. So it's like, and it's still responding, yes, I am here. The issue is you can't authenticate to it because I, uh, Karma doesn't hold the key, so it's, you'll never authenticate, but it's still a viable access point. But it's just because the credentials don't match, it'll never force a connection. But it's not up here, That's my main question. But you're seeing it there? Okay, well, and, and like I said, so it, it, there's, uh, some chipsets are, are now starting to do different things with their probe requests, um, so not all of them do show up, um, but the majority of them 
will. And sometimes it, it, it takes a while because especially in a group of this many people, it is responding to a lot of probe requests and it's a very small hardware. It's like 400 megahertz on the processor. So it's, it's really working overtime trying to respond to all these pro requests and authenticate people and, and doing things like that. Uh, so you won't all the time see everything. Now if we were in a small, just like a one-on-one -on -one session, I would be 95% confident that you would in fact see your... What if I'm sending all my coverage through Tor? Would he still be able to uh, um, intercept my network? Well, that, we're going to talk about that here in just, in just, a, in just a moment. So um, it, you, sir. Um, do me, do me a favor and go to, and pull up your browser, since you're nice enough to connect with me, and go to 172.16.42.1, and that's the actual um, router's IP address. 172.16.42.1. 172.16.42.1. I'm gonna pull this back for just a moment. And, and let you, if you'll let me know what you get. You shouldn't get much. It's slow. I, I was showing me it's still connected to the self-public. Okay. Anybody want to anybody connect and don't be a target voluntarily? There you go. Okay, he's got it. Nine cat, hit refresh. Yeah, whatever you want to do. Command F5, whatever, you know, um, F5 depending on your function buttons. And okay, yeah, 9 cats doing what the, What this is, I'm running um, a little package called random rickroll. And as you refresh the pages and you go to all these, uh, uh, if you keep going to this address, you're going to get um, peanut butter jelly time, Afro Circus, um, never going to give you up in ASCII characters, and it plays the music. Um, and it's a, it's a representation of the, the, the ability that I have. I'm a, but I can do this um, on the DNS level. I, I can run what's called DNS spoof. Um, because I'm the man in the middle, I can sit here and say, mm, every .com that you go to, I want to redirect you here. Or I want to do this with you. I want to do this. So I have full control over your, over your internet. Um, and we're, we're going to get back to this in just, just a little bit. Another issue, anybody familiar with Fire Sheep? Okay, really, really cool Fire, uh, Fox extinction, a extension that basically pulls unencrypted session cookies out of the air. Uh, and you can plug them directly into Firefox. And now I can be logged in as your Facebook or, or whatever stuff. Um, I haven't used this in about six or seven, eight months. So, but this is a real world thing that was got a lot of publicity about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, this is a real world so, um, system that's called sidejacking, where you're actually stealing the cookies, injecting them into your browser. And now I'm you. So this is just another attack that is widely available on the internet. Uh, all you gotta do is search Fire Sheep and you'll get a wealth of knowledge that uh, DNS re redirection, I'm your ISP now. I'm the man in the middle, I can sit here and go, I can send you anywhere you wanna go. All right, let me rephrase it, I can send you anywhere I want you to go. Um, uh, and so you can get really malicious with this type of technology, with this type of system. I don't do that, I do it for an educational purpose, uh, but you guys can see the potential uh, damage that can be done with this. Phishing. This is a big issue. I'm hosting a web server directly on this router. I can contain fake Facebook, Twitter, all these different banks. There, there is actually an entire repository of nothing but phishing uh, template, HTML templates for um, for all these online services and stuff that I can load up directly into the web server and I can redirect you to, um, to, the, to the actual page on the router. Now, obviously, it's, there's going to be some things that you're going to see that looks a little bit different. If you go to Facebook.com, it's actually going to take you to Facebook.com slash index HTML by default, which is a little bit different. You don't see index.html. Um, and then sometimes you also see like Facebook.com slash Facebook.html. You'll start to see these weird uh, add-ons to your URL that you're not accustomed to seeing uh, when you're doing these kind of attacks. And so you've got to be aware of what's actually going on. 
Um, and we're going to get in the issue of HTTPS because I know somebody here is thinking, oh, I use HTTPS. I check all the time. We're going to get to that in just a moment, um, and you're going to be severely disappointed. Um, what will it cost you? All these attack vectors and things that we've talked about, these possible attacks, there's a lot more out there. Um, there's a lot more packed in this particular device that I use that I haven't even begun um, to, to scratch the surface on with you guys, uh, but it's outside the scope of this conversation. But everything that you've seen and other things is really possible. It really happens for real. I'll give you an example. I was paid to do a, uh, as a contractor to do wireless penetration and social engineering on a pen test for a company. And um, we, we, we worked out and we knew that the coffee shop right across the road from the company was frequently visited by employees in the afternoon and they would work from there. So I set up shop there because I had my tools. I was like, I'm gonna have some fun, see what, I, see what information I can get about the company externally. I was there about 45 minutes sitting in the coffee shop. Just, I was actually probably on Facebook, but I had this device running. And lo and behold, the uh, vice president of accounts comes into the coffee shop, orders some drink, and he sits down. And I, he sits down where I, I'm actually behind him, and I can actually see what he's doing. And he logs into his company's uh, SharePoint site that's publicly facing, but it's over HTTPS, so he's protected, right? wrong. Using, a, using something that, I, that I'm going to discuss here in a, a minute called SSL strip, um, it allowed me to actually strip away the SSL and see his username and password in plain text. You're like, okay, so I have a username and password. Well, I sent the uh, username and password via text to my partner who was actually inside the company doing the, the rest of the actual physical pen test. And within 15 minutes, I got a phone call. I said, all right, we got to go. We got to meet with management now. Turns out that SharePoint was, was controlled by Active Directory inside the, other, inside the company's network. The IT department, as brilliant as they were, made every manager level employee a domain admin. So within about an hour's time of initiating this test, we had domain admin access, and specifically we had access to all 16 years financial data. Pen test over. Major debriefing. The uh, VP got called in, he came in, he was in tears. He thought he was gonna be fired. And we had to reassure him, he did nothing wrong. This was not his fault. This was not a end user's fault. This was a network IT fault. This was a security issue that had to be addressed. Um, and we went through a lot of addresses. And this, is a, this was a really unique situation where everything just lined up per, uh, perfectly. But let's jump over to you. You're sitting in coffee shop. You're surfing the internet. You log into, oh, I don't know, your email. And the same attack is going on. I'm sitting behind you. You're connected to me. What's the dangers of me having your email address? What, what's your name, sir? Jason. Jason? Uh, Jason, can I have your email and password? No. Please? Please? No. All right, okay. All right, okay. <laughs> is, it, well, is anybody willing to give me your credit card number and pen? I, need, I want the pen as well. Okay, nobody's going to do that because, one, I'm a complete stranger, and two, that's completely stupid. Well, we're giving this information away, or we're making it so that this information, we're just handing it off to somebody. But we're not checking behind ourselves to make sure that it's actually secure. Uh, so I want you to think, what would the worst possible situation be if I took over your primary email account? Forgot password. Forgot password is huge. Anybody using a second email address to, to authorize or authenticate the first one? Well, now we can start daisy chaining. Anybody ever use a repeat password? Nobody better raise their hand. Don't do it. Don't use repeat passwords. Anybody use online banking? Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, Twitter. Guess what? I'm now, all of these services are tied to your email address. I control them. I control your email address. I control your digital image. 
this can be catastrophic. There was an example uh, of a, a journalist that this happened to, and there, there was a little bit of stupidity and, and things, uh, social engineering, where this happened to a few years ago. But this is a, this is a real instance. This can actually happen. Um, and nobody cares about your security at all. I don't care about it. In fact, be less secure. It makes it my job easier. I don't have to work. Actually, I don't, it doesn't have to work as hard. <laughs> but you have to be actively uh, concerned about your security. When you're out in public, when you're away from your home network, that should be the first thing you think about is how am I vulnerable? What am I giving up by connecting to the self network or to this network or to that network? It has, excuse me, has to be at the forefront of every, every conversation that you have. You dare to venture outside but need internet. Now what? Huh? Well, we're going we're gonna to get in that. And I'm personally not a, not a big fan of Tor um, just because it's just so slow. Um, but th there's options. How do I protect myself? We've seen the, the types of attacks and things that this gentleman was so kind to connect directly to me. Um, I didn't initiate it at all. He did it or his device did it. Uh, this is essentially that karma is actually social engineering your computer, which is kind of cool when you look at it in that term. It's like, I mean, it's like um, pulling up at a valet. You got a real sketchy dude standing there. You're like, you the valet? Yeah, man. Really? You know, but it, on, on the networking level, it's like, all right, that's cool. Yeah, you don't look sketch. But in reality, we are. Uh, encrypt your traffic. And there's many, many ways to do this. And, and this is where we're going to discuss things like, um, uh, you said Tor and things like that. VPNs. VPN service providers are dirt cheap. You can get them for around $5 a month if you want to. You can change the levels of security. OpenVPN runs pretty fast, so you're not going to lose a lot of your throughput on, on your internet connection. Uh, anybody like to do really cool stuff with SSH tunnels? You can actually run SSH tunnels with a SOX proxy, and you can encrypt all of your web traffic. Uh, your network selection. Be careful. Be conscious about what networks you're choosing to connect to. Uh, has anybody had the pleasure of going to DEF CON? Okay, uh, the, uh, the wall of sheep, I've been on the wall of sheep twice. Most embarrassing thing of my life because I was stupid about my network selection and they made me pay. Um, cellular networks, how many people use, uh, have broadband cards? Mobile hotspots. Mobile hotspots gets a little bit different because you are broadcasting a wireless network. Um, I only do my banking through my cellular network. I don't do it on my home Wi-Fi or my home network. I don't do it in the public Wi-Fi. Currently, cellular technology is, I, I, I will not use the word secure. It's obscure. We don't, we're just now developing the tools specifically on GSM, not so much on CDMA, to actually be able to test the security of these networks. How are there any vulnerabilities like we see in Wi-Fi um, and actually be able to jump on these carrier networks and kind of play man in the middle and do these things. So until the technology and the price point of all this stuff comes down, there is a, um, a level of security through obscurity just because I can't infiltrate that yet. Question. So that's the difference between using your cell phone as the AT and connecting wireless to it. Yes, that is, that is different. Now, the, the, the thing here is, Typically, they're using WPA2 keys, which you can crack those if you've got enough force, you know, uh, and, and computational power and all. But as a whole system, as a mobile system on the go, that offers you a level of protection versus Wi-Fi. And the other thing is it gets back to the trust factor. Do you trust your carrier or do you trust Starbucks Wireless with me sitting in it? Okay. Uh, I actually trust my uh, cell phone carrier a lot more than I do my ISP. It's, well, I don't think I do anymore because all this stuff that's come out with the NSA and stuff, it really doesn't matter anymore. It's like having your data center. There's, there's a Y coming out of it. One goes to the internet and the other goes to the internet, <laughs> also known as the NSA. So 
uh, the use of cellular networks and cellular broadband is uh, something that I would encourage you to guys to, to, to use as opposed to a public Wi-Fi system. So at least you have the control over, you can restrict who's connecting to it. I don't have a methodology for replicating your, your, your keys until I actually crack your keys. Well, if you're in Starbucks, I'm, unless your password is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or something like that, I am not gonna have enough time to, to actively crack your key then to be able to do anything. So uh, like the hotspot features, the, uh, the MiFi's and things like that, for now, they offer a level of security just because you actually control to a degree that you can't in a public setting. I don't think Jeremy and the guys are gonna let you just come in here and mess with the self-network for your own security features, which you can do that a little bit with, with the cellular networks. All right, now, for some reason it cut the last slide off. Um, but yeah, things like, you know, things like SSH tunnels, you've got to encrypt your traffic. It just, hands down, you've got to encrypt it. Um, their, their services, how many people are familiar with OpenVPN? How many people own an OpenVPN server? Shame on you guys for not owning it. Why? You can run this in VirtualBox, VMware. You got an old laptop, Solo Ubuntu. Pseudo apt get uh, OpenVPN AS for the access server. You get two, for, two free client certificates. You can use it anywhere where. You can use it on your cell phone. You can use it on your Mac, your, your uh, Windows. And this offers you, no matter where you're at in the world, you can tunnel back home, which has its added advantages because you can now use your home network resources. Um, you know, you got a, a NAS at home but you're here in Charlotte paying $9 a, a day for Wi-Fi in the hotel room, you wanna go back and watch um, or stream videos that you legally obtained, um, you can do that. It, it adds another level. But the biggest thing is it's, in, it's encrypted. And with Karma specifically, it handles encryption um, just like you would expect any other access point to. I can see your data stream. I can't touch it. I can, I can see that you're connected to me. I can see all this traffic going. You know, if I do a, do a packet capture, I can see this encrypted stream. But unless I can actually break the encryption, you know, later, because I'm not, definitely not going to be able to do it in real time, I can't do anything. So, if, by, like, I've been on VPN this entire conference, um, and this is something, any, I, I, I actually use VPN even when I'm in the office and stuff. Um, because it doesn't matter, I, I'm not as worried about who I connect to because I know at least my traffic and my passwords are encrypted. So like over o OpenVPN, which is using SSL, let's say I log into Facebook using HTTPS. Well, I have an SSL tunnel and then HTTPS, which is another SSL going through that. I'm not worried about somebody stealing my passwords yet. Um, eventually we'll probably get there. I mean, there's, there's methodologies and there's things like that. But as a generic, uh, as a general principle, I'm not as worried about it because I do have a level of encryption um, that's available to me. And I, as an outside person, am having a hard time getting into that tunnel. Question or statement? I'll just mess my beard. But, um, so if you're, if you're on a network and all you have is a router, that's kind of insecure because you want to have somebody because uh, some routers don't have the right firmware or they don't have the um, right security options to uh, be like the gateway, the gatekeeper. You know, like for, for uh, in, in um, Ghostbusters and the gatekeeper, mm -hmm. he, he, he decides which passes in and out. Yeah. So is there a way to like make it more secure or just... Uh, are you, as far as your home network? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's things, you, uh, first thing, if you're using standard firmware, I'd, I'd recommend everybody here uh, to go buy a router that actually supports third-party open source software. Um, I can't recommend DDWRT anymore. I used to be a big proponent until I found out that um, by default, and they refuse to change this, that if I navigate to your public IP address, there your router is. I can log into it. Um, all you gotta do is add a firewall rule. You can fix that, but that, that, they refuse to add that. Um, so I was doing, I was doing a, uh, going through a block of our uh, third-party VPN service provider's IP address, 1,000 
addresses and I found about 170 DDWRT routers publicly facing. And I was like, I was like that's so disappointing. But you can check out like uh, Tomato. Um, you can't look at DDWRT, OpenWRT. Uh, my company, we produce a, um, a build of Tomato that has VPN capabilities uh, um, and some, some different features. So I definitely look at that um, because that gives you a, a more granular control than your stock firmware. You can, you can start manipulating, you can start blocking specific types of traffic and things like that where the stock, I, I honestly believe um, consumer router companies just don't give a flip. They're just like, here you go, this is what you need. This, this is more than enough. Um, and in my company specific, we're trying to just do away with that completely. What's well, in a gateway server? Like, you have a gateway, then you have your router, and it's OBSD or... Yeah. Um, I, I, I personally don't, haven't used a gateway server, so I really can't answer that question. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really not sure, um, just because I, I, I've never had a, a need for it. Um, I've, I've typically run um, uh, open source routing platforms and like firewalls like PFSense, Monowall, Smoothwall, things like that. Um, and I've just kind of trusted that they've known what they were doing until I learned what they were doing and realized, wait, no, they don't exactly. Let's go and fix this and work on some other things. Um, but you're in an open network. Don't do it, guys. Just don't do it. Question. SSL strip, it, it's a, uh, let's see if I can do this. Are you setting yourself up to the, like, an SSL proxy? Yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah, kinda. It, it's a, uh, um, essentially what it's doing is, and, and, and Facebook works brilliantly. Uh, Twitter doesn't, which is awesome. Uh, Gmail, like Google services, it's a hit or miss. Sometimes I can actually return the plain text password. Sometimes I'll return nothing, or I will return the password as it's encrypted. So, but essentially SSL strip, what it's doing is, I'm the man in the middle, you initiate an HTTP session through me, I then make that session on your behalf to Facebook. So I'm actually maintaining the, the HTTP session. But when it gets returned back to you, to your browser, if you look very carefully, you're now on HTTP. Uh, so I'm actually stripping out that, uh, the HTTPS on your end, but you actually, the, the, the full connection is making it all the way to Facebook as a, as a secure connection. I was just going to make a comment about that. On top of that, it also has a couple of other changes that would try to make it harder to know if you're on HTTP anymore. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're, we're, we're sorry, the, the, especially the latest iterations of SSL strip, you're, you're not seeing these security certificate warnings and all this other stuff that it, it's making it a lot more, um, uh, it, it's really hiding what you're doing. And that's why we have to be very observant and very persistent with, we can't just, I have so many people that say, oh, I, I, I check for, for the S all the time. No, you don't. Nobody checks for HTTPS all the time. I don't, I forget, you know, or, or I have this little lock. You know, I see the little lock. I have the little lock. I own that little lock. I have the favicon and I can send it to you on your HTTP session. It looks similar, it doesn't look quite the same because it's in the spot. Yeah, it, 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 it is shifted over a little bit, but for the average general user, how many people's gonna notice that? And that's the thing, it's, it's about um, until 802.11 and, and, and these things, the standards actually get rewritten and we're not, these, these issues aren't gonna go away. So how do we, how do we do, deal with that? We educate ourselves. Um, how many of you guys knew that these kind of vulnerabilities existed prior to this talk? Okay, good many, that's awesome, I, I'm glad. Um, and how many of you are actually actively taking measures right now in this talk to prevent these kind of things? Not all of you that just raised your hand. Okay, see, so it comes down to education. Uh, you guys, uh, I would hope, are going to take extra levels of protection, but your wife, your, your kids, they're not going to do this. They're, they're, huh? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, different things. Um, Neil, that company, we went back a year later, they had fixed all those issues. Um, so, 
Question. Well, uh, just an observation. One of the reasons I'm here today is, you know, back in, uh, I was taking a class, networking class at uh, CPCC here in Charlotte. Uh, uh, you know, it required us to use Wireshark and had us do, uh, you know, capture our own packets. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, I watched my, uh, my POP account password with my ISP uh, flash right before my very eyes and uh, I kind of went, that's my password in plain text. Immediately I changed my, uh, my I went into, the, I found out the ISP is Time Warner Cable <coughs> that uh, doesn't offer any way to encrypt your POP account password. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many people are aware of that. I, yeah, um, you know. So immediately now, now all my mail gets forwarded to another account that is that I do check through SSL. Uh, you know, use SSL for that. But just yeah, yeah this kind of stuff. Yeah, th 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 there's some scary. And specifically with this plat, if if anybody is interested, um, like I said, I'm not gonna. This is not a, a how-to session or anything like this. Um, this device right here. Um, it's, it's actually called a Wi-Fi pineapple. The little character you've been seeing is actually the logo for, for this device. Um, and uh, it's built, it's running Athros chipset. It's really cool. You can actually go uh, to um, hack5.org's organization that, that built these things. They run about $99. You can actually buy them yourself, flash the firmware if you want to, um, and, and really play around with it. This, this device has so much capabilities. I talked about the WPS vulnerability earlier. Um, and the, the attack, or, or the software to actually brute force that was called Reaver. It was released uh, now about a year and a half ago. Um, that, that, that technology, or that uh, software is, I can run it directly from this device. Um, so I can actually sit here and just go drop this off. As you can see, I'm running on a 10,000 milliamp battery, and I have, I have several of these, and they're running in Pelican cases that I can just go and deploy out in public areas. Um, has a USB port. I'm currently using, running a, just a four gig uh, USB so that I can have, uh, yeah, for you guys who can't see this, this is the actual device. Um, this is just the battery pack. Um, but what's really cool about this particular device is it supports 3G modems. Yeah, so I can plug a 3G modem, 4G modem into here and I can main a persistent SSH tunnel into this device wherever it's at. Um, so I can actually remotely attack you from the comfort of my recliner, which is very comfortable, by the way. Uh, uh, Hack5.org, H-A-K-5.org. Um, they've got a great, they, they, it's a podcast series. Uh, uh, Darren, um, Darren Kitchen and Shannon Morris do it. They've been going for about five or six years now. Wealth of information, um, all kinds of things. Um, they actually helped develop this. The community is really big. I will give you a note. This is classified as a professional wireless penetration tool. It's not a toy. I don't use it as a toy. I use it as an educational device. I've hacked myself so many times with this device because um, I want to figure out what it's doing and, and am, I, am I vulnerable? I want to protect myself. I really don't care about you guys as much as I do about myself. Um, and so, but you can check this device out. You can also check out uh, Karma, which is a host APD. You can run it um, directly off of anything that's uh, an Athros chipset. Um, I think the uh, AT5K and the AT9K chipsets, it'll support it right out of the box. Um, so you can actually simulate a lot of these attacks. You can go download SSL Strip. You can go download Reaver. You can go download and, and actually do this from, from your laptop. But what's nice about this particular device is it is extremely portable. I've stuck it up under a coffee table. I've stuck it all kinds of places. Uh, stuck it in a metal box with a Bell South telephone sticker on the side of it and stuck it on a light pole. Um, on a street corner one time in downtown Greenville. You should have seen the looks when I'm just walking up and and stick it in my bag and walk off. Um, and, and at that point, all I was doing is uh, um, complete transparency for that particular session. I was just mo looking at all the available networks that are around and looking at the encryption levels, whether WPS, WPA. I was also capturing all the MAC addresses so that I could look at the vendors. Yes? So if you're, 
if you have a hidden SSID, how, how can you pen test for that? Is there software that... Oh, uh, hidden uh, SSIDs. That's fine. That's fine. Um, it's still broken for it, you remember it. What? Well, it's, it, even if it's not remembered, you, let's, say, I mean, let's say I'm sitting in your driveway, you got a hidden SSID. Do you know what that does to stop me? Nothing. I don't need your SSID. I need your MAC address, which I can see. Using tools like Aircrack NG, that suite, which is a phenomenal, that's where I started, I can actually see your access point. I don't know what the SSID is, but I can then start running um, uh, different attacks and stuff and, and doing um, packet injection and deauthentication attacks to build enough information that I can now authenticate to your network. So with the MAC address, what gets your MAC spoofing, your MAC address is broadcasting as a spoof MAC? Um, is it a little bit harder or? It, yeah, it is, it is definitely a little bit harder in that case. Um, I haven't done a lot against a Mac, uh, spoofed MAC address, so I can't, I, I'm not going to even guesstimate it at the, the level of difficulty, um, but my guess um, is that it is going to add a, a layer, but I'm not going to say that it's going to, I just don't believe that it's going to be a, um, any, much more of a protection. It may slow you down a little bit, but not a significant amount. So any other questions? Yes. There you go. The, the guest network that I normally connect to. Well, okay. In, in this case, the, the reason why that is is because you're actually you're not probing hidden SSID. You're probing Duke Blue or Puke Blue or whatever it was, um, or or guest. Um, and, and so I, I, it doesn't matter. Now, I think his question is more is like attacking a to a, a hidden network where I just, I just land in your location, do a quick scan, see all the networks around, and I can't actually see everything that's broadcasting, whether it's hidden or not. I have a lot of friends who uh, say that your uh, router does not broadcast far enough for it to be affected by um, people going and going for it. Is that okay, uh, well, well that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I, I have this really, really um, nice setup called, uh, I actually have two, I have a, uh, a 48 dBi parabolic dish, as well as a 28 dBi Yagi array. Um, I will often go to the mountains um, outside of where I live um, and be able to reach access points up to six miles away, line of sight. Yeah, distance is not a factor. If I, I and it, but it's all it's all going to be on my end. I have to have enough power to go s to actually get to you. Uh, one perfect thing. Um, anybody familiar with Alpha uh, Alpha Networks? They make a line of um, uh, USB adapters and stuff. Um, this is a godsend for people like me. It supports packet injection. This is also a one watt. Uh, transmitter, which is illegal in the United States. By default, it operates at 500 milliwatts, which is the FCC limitations. So naturally, I travel to Belize a lot um, to, uh, to do, you know, for, for my exploitations and things because I actually can get a full one watt out of this. With, and I, it typ I typically use this 9 dBi antenna with it. Um, and I can see some things that are ridiculously far away based off your standard uh, adapter. Um, and so when you plug a Yagi adapter into, into this and then USB, it's pretty much game over. I can sit here and go to the um, Bank of America building, go up on top, that would be fun. You know, uh, currently they're not gonna let me do that, unfortunately, but um, yeah, that has, it's the possibility. Any other questions, comments, fears? Yes. Uh, well, the, the, ne the, the next steps is first is absolutely, uh, uh, first of all, check out hack5.org. They have a lot of this information, especially on the forums and stuff like that. Do, research these attacks, Fire Sheep, um, Wi-Fi Pineapple Karma, actually jump down into to the bare level of how these things are working. Specific, that's what I did with the probe request, because I'm going, that's ridiculously cool and ridiculously scary. Um, I don't want you to never connect to the internet. Um, because I believe the internet is a free system and we should be able to use it freely without fear. But unfortunately, we can't and we probably never will be able to. 
So but the, the biggest thing is, is form some kind of tunneling system, encryption, um, OpenVPN, PPTP, SSH, do something. Oh, anybody use proxies? Okay. Uh, pro yeah, yeah. I, I had somebody one time, it's like, oh, I, I just I always have a proxy in my browser so I don't have to worry about that. Well, all that's doing is moving your termination point, where your traffic dumps out on the internet. You still don't have a level of encryption, so I can still see, oh, pfft, going this way. Uh, so um, I, I like, I use proxies, but I always use proxy, like specifically a squid proxy, and I use that in conjunction with uh, OpenVPN. Are you behind seven proxies? <laughs> I am not gonna answer that question. Actually, if you use, if you use Tor, it's uh, almost impossible to track unless they can find your onion layer that you're connecting to? Yeah, yeah, and because you're, ra you're rapidly jumping and every, and every you know, and I'm, I haven't jumped into the, to the real uh, fundamentals of how Tor is working as far as when it's deciding to switch and, and, and randomize those proxies. What happens is that you connect to the onion layer and then this layer will send you to a exit node. And mm -hmm. there's exit nodes that are just managed and uh, you'll pop up and say like Vietnam and it'll pop up their exit node and then if a onion lawyer finds somebody's trying to watch, it will then switch you to another node, and it will yeah. keep jumping. Yeah, and the, and the, the, the sole issue that I have with that is it's just slow. But it's secure. But it, it, it is secure. Whoever you're trying to connect to is going to drop your traffic anyway because everything else coming out of Tor is garbage. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and it, it's a lot. And the other is real advantage of, like, specifically OpenVPN um, is that I can run it on port 443. Any IT admins here, sys admins, network admins, do you block 443 on your network? There you go. You're at work, you, you, I don't, you know, heaven forbid you actually be, you know, not productive and on Facebook or something. Guess what? People like them can actually see your traffic. They can see what you're doing. Let's do, SS, SS, you know, do an SSL session back home or to a server somewhere else. Now, obviously, they also can see a consistent SSL stream. <laughs> wow, he's been connected to this server for a really long time. You know, but it gives you that glance. We, uh, the company I work for, so by technology, we have VPN router, router appliances all over the world. We have a lot of customers in China. Anybody familiar with the Great Firewall of China? It is, oh, it is difficult. They, especially uh, for a while, everybody was using PPTP, only one port, 1194. So naturally, China's like, uh, no. They just start, they start blocking that port. OpenVPN, you can pretty much use any port you want to. So, and we, we're, at, we're actually having to constantly chase the ISPs and the government and moving our customers from port to port to port to stay ahead of of what's going on. Um, and they're getting really smart, man. They're, they're doing some stuff. We're still trying to figure out how, the, how they're actually, but they're saying, you know, if, if the sessions are lasting too long as far as the, con, the continuous uh, SSL tunnels, they're actually, what they're doing, they're, is, they're just um, basically flipping a switch on the internet for just a few minutes. And so now you've got to force to reconnect. And it, it, it's just, and a lot of the VPN server providers do this thing where after so many failed attempts, it just stops. So now, now, unbeknownst to you in a lot of cases, you're back on local internet where China can see you. I have uh, no idea of the technical details, but there are enterprise grade routers that can differentiate between OpenVPN to D port 443 and an actual HTTP yeah. connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's, there's, there's things out there, but it, not everybody's gonna have that. Um, we're talking about some serious money to do that stuff. And I'll, um, but I can also go out of um, 53 on UDP. You know, of course, that does look a little suspicious when you have a bunch of SSL traffic going out. Where, well, that's not DNS. But I can, you know, I, can, I can assign it any port that I want to so that it does offer me a level of security that, that you just typically don't get, specifically with uh, like PPTP. Um, and the other thing with, uh, against Tor is I don't control Tor. I control my server. I control my VPN server. Yes? Yeah, I was going to bring something up about Tor. Uh, the exit node may not necessarily know where you're coming from, but if you don't already have some sort of encryption to begin with, they can still sniff your passwords. And anyone can run an exit node. Yeah. Anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? We're, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. So if we get a tempo hat anywhere? 
Uh, yeah, tinfoil hats really do work. Um, they make people make you look retarded so people stay away from you. Um, <laughs> but you're the guy I'm gonna go after. Because um, I'm like, eh, he's, yeah, he, he you know. Uh, but wrap everything up real quick. Be conscious that your security is in your control. You can make the decisions. You don't have to trust people. I don't encourage you to trust people. The very reason that you're not going to give me my credit card, you should be conscious and you should be concerned about how your bank processes things. It's okay to question things. Um, I, had, I was with a bank for a while that used to actually send my statements to my email address. And I was like, I don't like that. And I voiced a complaint, I voiced a complaint, and a bunch of other people now. So now it's, I get an email that says, your statement is ready. Click here to log in. And so then I log into the actual banking website, and then I can view my statement. And from there, I can download it, I can print it, I can do whatever I want to. But it's not being sent to me so that if anybody just happens to be in inside my email account, they're like, oh, well, he's got this bank. This is, you know, oh, this, he works for this company because I can see this paycheck. And, you know, it can get real scary real fast when you start handing over information on open networks. So I do appreciate you for your time. I will be out at, uh, outside for a few minutes if you have any other questions. So. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler, faster, and more technologically feature-rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing.
Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, 
in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.